Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Man, that was awesome. I, uh, I couldn't help but think when I was standing there singing that song boldly, I approached the throne in the bridge where you know, it talks about how, you know, it says this is the art of celebration. Just how awesome it is that we get to have a relationship with Jesus and that we get to know him. And as we sing this last song, how, how amazing it is that his grace has saved us. And I hope you know, those words ring true for you like they do for me. The art of celebration, knowing that we're free from condemnation. I hope, I hope knowing Jesus and recognizing that he saved you and that he cares about you and that you get to do church and faith and, and community and things like that as a result. I hope, I, hope that doesn't, I hope that doesn't get boring for you. I hope that doesn't just get old and routine, but that you continue to realize we have so much to be excited about and celebrate. It's so good. Anyways, good morning, you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I hope you guys have had a good week full of exercise, uh, working out, all, getting rid of all those extra things, giving pounds that I'm sure you packed on last weekend. Um, I was actually kind of thinking about it this week that uh, as far as like, you know, uh, bigotry against species goes, Thanksgiving is really brutal, you know, because at Christmas or Easter, people will eat whatever, like they kill whatever animal they want, you know, it's kind of random, but for if you're a turkey, you just know. You know, October is coming, November in the States, and you're just like, I'm dead. There's no way they're going to kill one of my pig friends or one of these cows. Like, you're just dead. And so I, for other reasons as well, but I'm just really glad that I'm not a turkey. Because that's, you know, you could escape at Christmas, but Thanksgiving, no chance. It's been an awesome weekend at FBC already. Uh, if you weren't here for a family experience on Friday, we had a, a movie night here on Friday. There were almost 600 people packed into this room. It was kind of like a giant mosh pit just with Smurfs playing and popcorn flying everywhere. Um, it was awesome. Uh, today, like Doug said, we've got Engage coming up, which uh, I'm really pumped for. It's something new that we're launching here at FBC. Um, just a really cool weekend already, um, and I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, like Doug said, we're starting a new series called The Anatomy of a Disciple. And uh, this is what we call a church-wide series here at FBC. So what that means is we're doing it on Sunday mornings. We're also doing it in our small groups. So all our small groups throughout the week are kind of on the same stuff. And uh, with this one in particular, actually, FBC Youth is doing it as well. So on Sunday nights and the youth small groups, they're going to be working through the same series, which is uh, really awesome. So that means, you know, from grade 7 students all the way up to, like, the oldest person in our church, which it probably is Doug, um, is everyone is kind of going through this journey together, which is really awesome. So anyways, I, I want to dive right into this, but let me just uh, pray really quickly and then we'll hop right in. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that you love us and thank you that we get to uh, be a part of this cool community called church that uh, you've made, God. Um, I pray that we would be a church that always celebrates that and always remembers how how good we have it because you are so good to us, God. Um, please just show up this morning. Uh, use this series, use this morning to speak to us and help us uh, to... Uh, Continue to learn how we can better engage with you, God. We love you so much. Amen. So, in life, there are a lot of different, you know, ways you can say the same thing. A lot of different terminology and phraseology. So, you know, maybe you might call someone a janitor, but perhaps they prefer the term custodian or uh, caretaker. Or if they're really fancy, they want to be called, like, a custodial engineer. Or if they have a lot of time on their hands, maybe they've come up with the job title, health, inspection, quality, assurance, or something like that. And you're like, no, nah, man, you're a custodian. But um, we have a lot of different ways that we say some of the some of the same things. And we do the same thing here in church as well. We talk about some things and we have a lot of different meanings we pour into with different words. For example, Jesus. Sometimes, you know, maybe if you're new at church, it's a little confusing sometimes because, you know, one week he's Jesus, the next time he's Christ, he's Emmanuel, you know, especially around Christmas, Lord, Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, you know. Um, but it's all these different words that kind of point to a different element of what we're talking about. And when we talk about people who su subscribe to Christianity, we also have a lot of ways that we describe them, a lot of different phrases. And uh, 
generally they all kind of point to the same thing, but kind of focus on it maybe a slightly different aspect, or maybe people just like the sound of it. For example, you know, if you listen to me talk, usually I would refer to myself as a follower of Jesus. That's one of my favorites. Some people call themselves Christians, or a believer, or say they're born again, or an evangelical, or, or whatever. Maybe you've come up with some other really cool term for it as well. But one of the really common terms that I'm sure all of you have heard of, especially if you've looked at the screen in the past minute, is the term disciple. And, and this is obviously the word that we're going to kind of be unpacking throughout the series, and we're going to be looking at what this series would call the anatomy of a disciple. So kind of the, the composition, the, the skeleton, the, the buildup of what a disciple looks like. And over the next seven weeks, on Sunday mornings, eight weeks, if you're in a small group, uh, what we're going to be doing is essentially, really, when it comes down to it, looking at two kind of big questions. We might not talk about these questions every week, but essentially over the next seven weeks, we hope to kind of unpack and discover some truths behind two of these questions. First of all, the first question, and if you've got a bulletin or app notes or whatever, you can follow along. Um, it, question number one is simply, what is a disciple? So the dictionary would define a disciple as a follower or student of a teacher, or leader, or philosopher. So someone who studies and learns from and kind of follows the teaching of you know, a teacher or a leader or a philosopher. So when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the biblical account, what we're saying a disciple is, is someone who looks at Jesus as teacher, leader, philosopher, and so much more than that, and subscribes to his teaching, learns from him, and studies from him, and follows his way of teaching. Um, the word disciple is, is a really big word in the Bible, like eight letters. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, it's a bad joke. But I'm, I'm becoming a dad in two months, so i got to practice my really bad dad jokes. But it's a really big word in the Bible, and then it shows up 296 times in the Bible. Only two of these are in the Old Testament. Some of them are in Acts, but 268 of these times are in just four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four Gospels, this is a word that is like all throughout the account of Jesus' time here on earth. And when you say the word disciple, for a first century Jew who was around when Jesus was around saying disciple, uh, what, what this word was, was it was someone who had what they would call in Hebrew a rabbi. And the Hebrew word rabbi, uh, you know, it doesn't directly translate, but the best way you could translate it would be to say, my master, or the great one. So this is usually kind of like what, like, so, so what you're doing is you're acknowledging like someone as better or superior or beyond you or greater than you. This is usually the word that Doug refers to me around the office as because he recognizes my superiority. Um, and so what a disciple would do with the rabbi is they not only followed and learned from the rabbi, but they would actually recognize and say, you're greater, you're beyond me, so I want to not just learn from you, but follow you. This is a lot different in our culture, right? Because when you hear something, we're, we're taught to listen critically. And I think there's something good about that, but you know, we're taught to listen critically, filter for the truth, you know, fact check, figure out is what they're saying true or not, or what, what's my opinion on it. And also, we're very individualistic. So why would we want to be like someone else? Maybe you want to learn something from someone else, but why would you want to be like them? But this idea of this disciple-rabbi relationship paints a picture where it says, no, no, you don't want to just learn from your master. You want to become like your master. You want to model your life like them. Your life should want to appear as theirs. So Jesus' disciples not only followed him, but they just tried to be like him. There aren't a lot of good examples like this in our modern culture. Um, people have people that they look up to or learn from or idolize or adore. You know, like there are believers who love Justin Bieber, Directioneers or into One Direction. But usually they're not like trying to get the same haircuts. I mean, if they are, like, God help them. But if they're not trying to look like them. Like, they'll wear the t-shirt, they'll listen to the tunes, they'll go to the concert. If they're brave, they'll admit to other people that they like Bieber, stuff like that. There's this one group, uh, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, probably a lot of you haven't, and they're called Insane Clown Posse, ICP for short. And so I'm not a hip hop guy, and I also think that there's like good and bad hip hop, and I think their stuff's pretty bad. Uh, vulgar, but also just pretty low rate. Anyways, they're strangely 
like huge all around the world. So whether you've heard of ICP, this is Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope, by the way. And whether you've heard of them or not, they'll go play somewhere where you'll talk to people and it's like no one's heard of them, and tons of people show up. They've got this crazy cult following, which is, a, a, I think, a good term for their following, good cult following that just shows up. And when you go to one of their concerts, if you go, you'll see hundreds or thousands of these people who are called juggalos. They're not just fans, and they look like this. This is what juggalos look like. So if you go to a concert, you'll see tons of people who not only listen to ICP, but look like ICP. They've got, if you go online, you can find a dictionary with their own like terms and words that they use because they are not only listening to ICP, but becoming like them, okay? If anybody shows up with their face painted like this next week, uh, I'm gonna tell you you missed the point of the message this week. <laughs> this is it's kind of a silly picture, but this is actually a good reflection of what Jesus is saying his disciples should be like. He said, I am the rabbi, I'm the master, I'm the great one. He's like, you, you, you can learn from me, but you can also model what I'm doing. So, so when we talk about what a disciple is, we're going to spend seven weeks unpacking that through the series, The Anatomy of a Disciple. But this morning, I want to look at a, kind of a quick, brief overview of some of the teachings of Jesus and what Jesus describes a disciple as in the Bible. So first of all, uh, I want to look at five things. First of all, the first one, a disciple is committed. So you can look at Mark 8, 34 to 38, and Jesus says this. He says, then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Um, for the five words here, I had uh, it's pretty easy to pick them, but this one was really challenging. We were trying to find the right word. I was talking to Jan in the office on Friday because one of the problems with the word commitment in our culture is it's almost meaningless. You know, when we talk about commitment, we think about marriage and relationships, and I mean, that essentially almost means nothing. Nowadays, people usually prepare when they get married to break the commitment. Um, and, and so the, the type of commitment here that we're talking about isn't just lip service to say, yeah, I mean, this is, this is people saying, I, I am all in no matter what. I will prioritize following my master, my rabbi, my teacher over all else, even my own desires, my own, my own ideas, my own comforts, anything. A commitment to being selfless and sacrificial in the way that you follow Jesus. When Jesus would say, take up your cross and follow me, his first century audience, Romans and Jewish people, they would know exactly what he's talking about. They would have seen people getting hung on crosses. They would walk the road, maybe on the way to work or the way to their religious meetings at the temple or whatever, and they would see people violently hanging on crosses, bleeding naked along the sides of the road. They, they probably knew people that got crucified. They might have watched one of their friends or family members or something like that get crucified. This was vivid language. And we don't really have that nowadays because I'm assuming and hoping that no one in this room has ever watched someone get crucified. But they knew what this meant. They meant that, that they should be willing to give up all in order to be committed and prioritize Jesus' teaching even over their own lives. This isn't a comfortable calling, but Jesus says that this is what a disciple truly looks like. So maybe in our culture nowadays, Jesus would say, if you truly want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and be a little bit less entitled, or spend a little bit less so that you can give more, or give up that extracurricular so you can invest your time more wisely, or, or watch a little bit less TV so that you can spend, your, I, I don't know what it is. And the question I have when I, when I read this passage for myself is, you know, can I actually point to times in my life where I can say, I actually have denied myself to follow Jesus? Because Jesus isn't saying, hey, you might have to deny some things in your life, but he's saying, this is going to take some sacrifice. Do you have things set up in your life where you say, yeah, I actually limit this. I make sacrifices to prioritize my commitment to Jesus. The second thing that I think the Bible says a disciple is, is obedient. So John 8, 31 to 32, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
Similarly, in Matthew 12, 48 to 50, Jesus, it says, he replied to him. So Jesus is talking to a guy who is asking him some questions. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, Jesus, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Who, whoever obeys me and follows the will of my Father, whoever is obedient, shows that they are a disciple through, through obedience. And, and the cool thing is, you know, we don't really like the ideas of rules and obedience. Those aren't like trigger words that make us happy because it feels oppressive and suppressive. But Jesus says, if you obey his teaching, you will know truth and the truth will set you free. The benefits to this are actually really great. If you know me, you know that when I was a kid, I loved Lego. I mean, I was a passionate Lego builder, Lego collector. And when I would get, like, for my birthday, I, I did have this, like, crazy Barbie phase for a little bit, but it didn't last very long, and I don't like to talk about that, but I love Lego. And uh, when I would get a Lego set, like, for my birthday or Christmas or whatever, I'd get, like, a sweet castle or ship or else, you know, sometimes just, like, a tiny little, like, horse and catapult if it was, like, an aunt who was really cheap or something. But, you know, my parents get me a sweet castle. I hope my aunts don't watch this on YouTube later. But um, i get, like, a sweet castle or something, and I would pull out the instructions, right? And I wouldn't just rip them in half and be like, I'm going to make a sweeter castle. No, nah, man, I'd flip page by page to the instructions and build this castle because it would be awesome. Left to my own devices, as not the manufacturer or designer of Lego, I would make what everyone makes when they make their own Lego set, and it's just a giant box, right? And so I would design this awesome Lego, Lego castle because I followed the instructions. The instructions actually brought me more fulfillment and joy out of what I was building because I followed them. I think if John 8, 31 to 32 was rewritten by Lego, they could put it in the front of their instructions and say, if you hold to these instructions, you are really a master builder. Then you will build the castle, and the castle will bring you great joy. The truth will set you free. Jesus isn't saying, hey, you know, I want you to obey me, but this means you got to cut off everything. Jesus is saying, I created you. I, I know you. You know, like, like, like the manufacturer designer of Legos, they're like, I know more than this eight-year-old kid that used to be obsessed with Barbie's nose uh, about Lego building. That's why our instructions make sense. Next, a disciple is productive. In John 15, Jesus gives this cool parable of how he's this vine and his followers are the branches of this vine. And in verses 5 to 8, this is what he says. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I am you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus says, if you're a disciple, show it by the productivity in your life. Show it by the fruit that comes out of your life. I love rock and roll. If you know me, my favorite genre of music is actually punk rock, specifically that from the 90s, which I know really isolates me from a lot of people in this room. But I also really love rock and roll, like classic rock. When we did the classic rock series here a couple years ago, uh, man, like you could say that series was like actually my jam. But uh, I love that stuff. And, and not only because the music is awesome, but because the bands are so awesome. You know, it's like so over the top, ridiculously cool. Like they come out on stage, like leather, they haven't showered in like four years, and, and girls still like them, and they got smoke and like fake blood and like dragons coming out on stage, fire everything. But one thing, if you watch a band like ACDC or something like that, they've got this giant wall behind them of amps, like speaker, amp speakers, and these giant speaker stacks behind them. And, and it looks so cool, and I'm just like, man, like I wish I owned a thousand guitar amps like that. The thing you might not know is all of those amps behind them in that glorious wall, they're all fake. None of them actually make any sound. It's all just fluff. It's all just show. So if you, if you and I were like, hey, let's go to an ACDC show together, and we showed up, what, what would happen is there would be this giant wall of speakers, and in behind there somewhere there would be one actual like real guitar amp that they would be plugged into, and that would be producing the sound into a microphone to go through the stadium. And if you were to ask me, hey, Ryan, would you rather they have like, the cool speaker stack that looks awesome and get rid of the real amp so it doesn't make any sound, or get rid of like, the cool speaker stack and have the amp that actually makes sound, I would choose the real one that actually produces some sound. Otherwise, we would be watching ACDC just like, awkwardly dancing around 
to silence and like smoke and lights and stuff up there and it would be really lame. Jesus is saying, I don't, I don't care what you look like. I don't care how funny you are. I don't, I don't care what you've done. He's, he's saying, I want you to actually be productive and produce fruit. And the Bible talks about the fruit that we can produce as his disciples, love, joy, peace. You, you know the list. People should be able to look at you as a disciple of Jesus Christ and say, because they exist, love is produced in the world. Joy abounds from them. They are a beacon of God's peace and hope. On that same note, I think a disciple is loving. In John 13, 34 to 35, I was talking about this a couple weeks ago. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is like the secret handshake, the ID badge, the like cool key card that gets you access into discipleship. It's a total non-negotiable with Jesus. Jesus isn't saying, yeah, you can be my disciple, but be like a complete jerk to people, you know? Be that moron that no one likes because you're mean to everyone. Say, no, you got to be a loving person. And maybe, maybe for some of us that's tough. Maybe you struggle with frustration. Maybe you struggle with anger. Maybe when you're driving, you're just like, your blood boils because no one in the world knows how to drive except you, right? And, you know, maybe, maybe you just freak out or maybe you struggle with patience with your kids or with the neighbor's kids or, or, or things like that. And I truly believe that if, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, that God wants to work through that with you and say, no, 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 no. Choose love. My disciples are loving. And, and as a result, people can tell that you're my disciples. And the fifth one I put is multiplying. A disciple is multiplying. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, you've heard this, this is after Jesus comes out to life and he leaves earth, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He's, he's saying, I've made this all. I'm above all. It's all been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We don't want FBC to just be a bunch of disciples for the sake of us getting to be disciples. You know, our, our goal isn't just everyone in this room becomes a disciple and then we've arrived. Our goal is that we create disciples who create disciples who create disciples who create disciples, and I could go on and on, but I have some other things I'd like to say as well, but disciples who just continue to multiply and spread as a result. Um, if you're in a small group, you'll watch the video, that, uh, you'll have watched the video this last week if you're an adult or this coming up week if you're in youth because we're a week off from each other, but in the first video, the guy asks a really pointed question. He says, if I were to ask you to make a list of people that you've intentionally discipled in your life, he says, would there be any names on the list? Or would there be very many names on the list? And it's kind of an intense, convicting question, because maybe for some of us, we would say, you know, there aren't any names, or there hasn't been a name for a long time, or maybe there are no names at all. This isn't just like a bonus feature that's just for, this isn't like, you know, at the end of the Marvel movie, I hope there's like that bonus scene at the end of the credits type thing. This isn't like the DVD players I could have had in my van for the extra nine grand or whatever. This is like, Jesus is saying, if you are a disciple, part of that DNA, part of the package there is that you are multiplying and that you are discipling others. It's not an option. You don't become a disciple and decide whether or not that's your calling. We do a lot of things here at FBC, and if you've been here for a while, you know that Two of the big things we do are FBC kids and FBC youth, and we're passionate about those. And the main reason we do those is so that kids and youth can be discipled. They can grow close to Jesus and be mentored by people who are older than them and can model that for them. But another amazing thing, another big reason that we do that is so that people have the opportunity to disciple people. We have these programs in place so that adults, people or teenagers who are older than the people that are discipling, can actually have an opportunity to complete, to make complete their call to be a disciple. To actually say, yeah, I actually want to be a, a complete picture of what Jesus says a disciple is and do that. It's not, it's not like a, an optional feature at the end of discipleship. This is part and parcel of it. And, and if you're not discipling people, or if you haven't in a long time, we would love to have a conversation with you and say, you know what, this is important. This is an imperative. How can we get you on a track where you're actually intentionally discipling people. The second question that this series will hopefully dive into with us is how am I doing? So if we look at what a disciple is, 
then the next question we would, we would look at is, how am I doing? Now, I think it's easy to hear these five points that I was just talking about and think to ourselves, all right, I need to do more, I need to change this, I need to make this plan, I need to structure my life like this. And I'd encourage you to slow down a little bit with that. Because I think sometimes that can take us down a path where we get so focused on our own doing and our own accomplishments that we forget to acknowledge the work that God is already doing in our lives. You see, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. God's grace alone is what saves you. Your faith in God's grace saves you. And you can't boast about that because it's God's work, not your work. But, but there's tension, partially because we're human, but also because you read other parts of the Bible, like James chapter 2. Pulled out a couple of verses from there. Verse 17 says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And later in verse 24, it says, You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. And I think sometimes it's really easy to jump to kind of opposite ends of the spectrum where you're so focused on grace that you forget to like ever you know, get up and do something with your life. Or else you get so focused on how you can become a disciple and what you can do and what you can accomplish and how awesome you are that you forget to acknowledge the work that God is already doing in your life. You see, when God created you, whether you like it or not, he began a work in you. He, he started. Without asking your permission, he started a work in you. And to be a disciple of Jesus Christ primarily starts with us acknowledging the work that God is doing, being thankful for that work, and simply responding to his call responding to the call that God has placed on our lives to be his disciples. At camp with the kids, we often use this analogy of like a phone call coming in. So we say, imagine your cell phone's ringing. You've done nothing to make it ring. You, you, you've had no part in that. That's totally outside of yourself. And all you do to accomplish a phone call in that case is you pick up the phone and you answer. You respond to the call. And I think that's a healthier picture of how we should approach discipleship in following Jesus. I think sometimes we get so focused on, you, you hear a message, you read something in the Bible, you talk about something in a small group, you're like, I gotta go do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, that we forget to slow down and acknowledge that God is calling you to action. And yes, your, your, your works and your actions and your deeds matter, but only in response to his call and only in response to his grace and only by his power that is at work in your life. And I love this because it makes us stay humble. It makes us recognize how good God is because God will do awesome things for your life. He'll use you for amazing things. But you have to stop and say, no, 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 no. I can't take credit for that because it is by God's grace so that no one can boast. This series uses a really cool model that I'm going to show you up here to dissect what they call the anatomy of a disciple. And so it breaks this anatomy into eight categories. And if you're in a small group, you'll see more about that. They also have a website. You can check it out and see all this and everything. But, but this model offers a pretty vivid picture of what it looks like to be a disciple. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to just be working through these categories and talking about how we can allow God to continue to shape us in these areas. But you'll see that it starts at this core of being humbly submitted. And this is so key. When responding to God's call to simply come to Jesus and say, I humbly submit as your disciple to you, master, rabbi, teacher, and acknowledge that you know best and I want to be more like you. And that's what Doug is going to be talking about next week. It's just this idea of being humbly submitted. This series, we're not hoping to give you guys a list of like do's and don'ts or go work on this or here's your new spiritual workout plan or something like that. We're hoping to give you guys some inspiration that God is doing a work in your life. He's calling, and he wants you to respond to him by being obedient and digging in. So this series has its own website. You can go on the internet and, and look it up and all that. Um, normally, I wouldn't say this, but if you're not in a small group, uh, you know, the videos are all in Right Now Media. There's a free downloadable study guide you can follow along. But more importantly, I'd say join a small group because it's better done in community. But you can check that all out on there. Another thing that uh, anatomy of a disciple has, and I just want to talk about this for a few minutes and we'll get you out of here, is this, uh, this self-assessment tool that they offer as part of this. To, so you can go online and take this test to see how you're doing. Now, if you go on their website, you'll see that the self-assessment test uh, costs $20 US, which is, I don't know, about $300 Canadian. And so it costs a bit, and it comes with a free reassessment you can take later. Um, but we've signed up as a church, and we've kind of built an account with them so that uh, with the link that we're going to give to you, all of you can take this assessment for free. 
Um, and this assessment, assessment is just a series of kind of multiple choice questions, and, and it takes about 25 minutes to do. It's pretty quick and painless and easy. And, and a couple of things I want you to know. First of all, your results are 100% confidential. We won't actually even know. We'll know the total number of people who've taken it, and we'll know the average scores throughout our entire church of everyone who's taken it. We'll never know the names of people who have even taken it, and we'll never know your individual results. That's between you, God, and, well, there are like links if you want to share your results on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but uh, that's between you and whoever you want it to be between. It's 100% confidential. But it's really useful in two ways. One way, these 25 minutes will just give you a cool, they give you a cool evaluation of some areas you can be working on, some areas that you're doing well in that you can continue to grow in. But also, since it does give us averages as a church, it gives us kind of a, a cool understanding of where at least whoever takes the assessment, an average in our church is at, and it helps us continue to pave a future direction in our church. So I really hope that you'll take this test. Like I say, it takes 25 minutes, comes with a free reassessment. The idea is that you'd take that a few months down the road and kind of see uh, where you're at there again. Now, I know I just said it's 100% confidential, but because I want to encourage you guys to take this and have a glimpse of what it looks like, and also because I'm not a very private person and uh, also don't mind you guys knowing some of my flaws and stuff like that, I thought I'd share some of my results with you. So uh, when you take the test, it shows you how you're doing in these eight categories. And it's very like kind, because instead of just saying weak, it says weaker. Uh, so that makes me feel a lot better as I get closer to that end. So I look at my results, it gives me this chart, and then it has tons of info that it writes out about this. But I can see that my strongest is biblically formed. And I can see that my lowest is, is kind of, uh, there are a few that are pretty close to that, but my, my actual lowest is inclusive community. And so it tells me, since I'm in that category for inclusive community, um, how I'm doing. And I thought, if I'm going to throw my results out there, I might as well, I'll share with you guys what they said about one of my categories, and I'll go with my weakest, uh, just to be totally transparent with you guys. So this is what it said about where I'm at with inclusive community. It says, God has been at work conforming your heart, mind, and choices to be more like Jesus. And you have indicated that your compassions have had some growth in inclusive community with people who are outside your normal spiritual community. You have had extremely limited opportunity or willingness to invite others from work, school, your neighborhood, or ministry exposures into the world, but you have taken a few steps to move in step with the Holy Spirit's leading in your life in this area. Um, when you have invited others into your world, you have likely experienced a degree of confidence from the Spirit that you are doing something good, but you probably have issues that are limiting your growth in this area, such as fear, selfishness, for sure, guilt, or shame. It doesn't say for sure after selfishness, tells me. Um, <laughs> That would just be rude. <laughs> you were probably wrestling within yourself to some degree, realizing this would be something God would want you to do, but not moving very intentionally in that direction. Then at the bottom it says, caution. Ask God to give you a deeper compassion for those outside your Christian friends. Don't allow guilt, shame, fear, selfishness to rob you of the joy, uh, joy of growth that God intends for you in this area. Ask him for the courage and wisdom to take another step to invite someone unlike you into your world and ask him to help you keep developing the core and the choices in your life as you continue to grow as a relationally healthy person, letting that growth overflow into this area of inclusive community. Which is pretty accurate and pretty helpful for me. And I've read that a few times now because I read it in both these services and also in my own. Uh, these are pretty cool, this is pretty cool feedback. They also have the second chart, and it breaks into three categories, believing, feeling, and doing. And you can see that my worst category, uh, by far, is doing. And so this is what it said to me about that. It said, you have developed your actions, but you are still growing here. Actions are a definite part of God's design and are most naturally an outgrowth of your beliefs and feelings lining up and being strong. Ideally, you have equally strong or stronger beliefs and feelings so that your action flows out of those qualities rather than being self-serving. If your doing is much stronger than your believing and feeling, be careful not to do things in your own strength. This can usually be helped by being in a biblical class or group that will challenge and sharpen your beliefs and or feelings. To me, this feedback was pretty helpful. I'm a disciple of Jesus that's still growing, and I have a long ways to go. And the self-assessment gave me some cool feedback as to how I can continue to grow, both in the areas I'm doing better in and the areas that I'm doing worse in. It takes about 25 minutes, but I encourage you, your relationship with Jesus, how you engage personally with God, is worth the 25 minutes. 
you know, whatever else you're going to do with those 25 minutes, give it up and take this test. We're going to give you a card on the way out, but these are the instructions that are going to be on the card. It's going to tell you to go to this link. It's a weird link, but that's how you get it for free. Um, and then it's going to tell you to create an account and log in, which takes two seconds. Then you have to then go through the purchase checkout process, but it's free, so you don't have to put in a card or anything. It's all free. And then you just take the self-assessment, view your results, and if you want, in a few months, you can take the free reassessment. I just want to, we're going to hand you guys a card on the way out so you have all this info. If you're using the app notes, all this info is in the app notes, so you already have it on your phone. Um, they say that the test works a lot better on a computer, so if you still own one of those, uh, you could try taking it on that, I would suggest. Um, one warning I want to throw out. I noticed when I took this test right at the start, there were a couple like doozies, like a couple questions where I was like, oh my goodness, if these are all questions like this, and it, it actually gets a lot easier throughout, but even if there are a couple questions that are tough to be honest on or tough to kind of figure out for yourself, just continue on. Like I said, I, I think it's really worth it. It's not like the biggest game changing thing in the world, but it's a helpful step in how you continue to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm sure we all have 25 minutes uh, that we can uh, throw into something like this. This week, uh, you know, is mostly just kind of an intro week. Haven't really got too deep into any of the specific categories, but just really wanted to give you guys a bit of an overview as to where we're going to be headed for the next couple months and, and, and to what to look at. For this week, what I would encourage you to do, besides take the self-assessment, is to start praying and asking God, as you approach these two questions, what is a disciple, what does a disciple look like, and how am I doing, to ask him to, over these seven weeks, to really just speak to your heart and show how you can continue to respond to his call and grow closer to him. You know, maybe over the next couple of weeks, maybe, maybe you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ and you wanna make that decision to follow him. Maybe, maybe you, you wanna to come to one of our baptism or mem and membership classes. Maybe you wanna, you know, find some areas in your life where you can continue to grow. Maybe you've been a disciple for a long time, but you recognize, God, there's still some areas that need some work. I hope wherever you're at that you'll spend some time praying this week and say, God, please just continue to shape me over these next two months as we move through this as a church. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for this morning, and thank you that you love us, and thank you that you extend relationship with you to us, God. It is amazing that we have the opportunity to know you and to grow closer to you. I pray that through this series, you would help us all uh, to grow as we try to be your disciples, that we would humbly acknowledge you as master and let you shape our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you guys have an awesome week. Next week, we've got Doug on week two, but more importantly, today is Donut Sunday, so go and enjoy a donut.